Hey there, it's time for another large format Q&A. I'm your host, Matt Marash, and this is a Q&A series that's usually responses to the Large Format Friday episodes that I run on this channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, I recommend doing so because each and every Friday we're gonna have a new upload with something about large format photography. You know, I've been getting so many good questions lately on the large format questions at gmail.com inbox that I wanted to do another Q&A response video addressing some of the really good questions I've been getting. So our first email comes from Ken and he has questions regarding x-ray film. Ken writes, I first heard about x-ray film photography from your Fractured Ulna's article some years back. Subsequently, I saw your studio video about stand development in Obsidian Aqua and I'm now enjoying your return to YouTube with LFF. I have a chemistry for OA as well as Pyrocat HD. Do you still recommend Obsidian Aqua? And if so, at the same one to 500 dilution and hanger development um, agitation? I'm using Fuji Super HRU since Green CareStream BRA has dried up. I did source some BRA recently from Mary X-Ray, but at double the price before ZZ Medical, another X-Ray film distributor, and CSX ran out. I question how fresh it is since Kodak has stopped making it. Uh, it seems like you were rating the film speeds a little higher back then when you were using OA, but your results were impressive. I have fairly good results with the green two-sided emulsion, but more problems with uneven development than the BRA, which is single-sided. Maybe a longer soak time? Thanks for your contributions to the large format revival. Well, Ken, you have a lot of questions here, and I wanted to clarify some of those points for the viewers at home who may have not yet started with X-ray film. So he's addressing a few different developers there. One of them is the most common uh, staining type developer I use, which is Pyrocat HD. It's a pyrocatechol based staining developer. And another variant of that uh, that was created by Jay DeFer, I believe, it's called Obsidian Aqua. It's a more hyper-concentrated version of it. It's a more active developer without as many of the restraining agents in that developer. So it just kind of like really boosts up your contrast and you use it in a very, very dilute medium, like one to 500, like Ken mentions. He also mentions a few different types of X-ray film. So the X-ray film I talked about on the episode for X-ray film was the FPP industrial X-ray film, which was a blue sensitive X-ray film. The one Ken's talking about in his emails here are green X-ray films, which are usually double-sided and higher sensitivity. They see uh, UV, blue, and green light, so they're still orthochromatic films, but they typically have a higher effective ISO when you're shooting it outside or even under studio lighting. One of the layers to the question is, do I still recommend Obsidian Aqua? Honestly, I haven't used the stuff in years because I don't have as convenient darkroom access as I used to. When my darkroom was only a minute or two away, it was really easy for me to go in, mix up some chemicals, uh, and develop fresh. Obsidian Aqua is a weird developer because you have a hyper-concentrated solution A, and then your solution B, or your developing solution, actually has to have a lot of washing soda. And I had to mix that up every time, so I was going through a lot of solutions and ordering chemicals way too often to make it sustainable. I switched back to the one that I learned on, which was Pyrocat HD, which is an AB solution. You have your developing agent, you have an activator, which is your B, and then you have water, which you diluted in. When you make that solution, it tends to last for a couple of years if you mix it in uh, propylene glycol or Pyrocat HD in glycol, or you can also mix it in distilled water and it's still good for about a year past mixing. What I like about Pyrocat HD is I have one long darkroom day where I mix that developer up in the glycol and then I don't have to worry about it for upwards of two years. So long story short, I don't use Obsidian Aqua that much anymore. I haven't mixed any up in years, but I've gone back to Pyrocat HD, which is a little bit more controllable for my more remote darkroom situation that I have going. As for the films, I've used uh, all the films that you've talked about here. The Fuji Super HRU, the ZZ Medical, CSX, Kodak, um, actually, the only one I haven't done too much with is the, uh, the BRA, which is a single-sided emulsion. Single-sided emulsions, especially the ones for mammography, those films are great because they, they're not as prone to scratching as other x-ray films, but it's just kind of a which do you prefer type situation. I learned on the double-sided stuff and it was fine for what I was doing. The double-sided film, one of the biggest worries is if you were trying to enlarge that film, you have emulsion on both sides and eventually your image at higher enlargement kind of like splits apart because you have one enlarged image on this side, one enlarged image on that side, and they kind of like 
ghost over themselves and they create some kind of odd haloing and softening when you try to enlarge it more than a couple times. We're having some development issues on BRA. I would say all x-ray films, give it at least a two minute soak. That really, really helps just to make sure uh, it's up to temperature and not like aggressively uh, developing. When you're using a developer like Obsidian Aqua, which is so, so active, you have to make sure it is very evenly mixed and very evenly soaked prior to that. He mentions an agitation procedure I also haven't done in a long time, which is called geometric agitation or geometric inversion. What that is, is I develop for 30 seconds and then agitate, I wait then a minute, and then agitate, I wait then two minutes, four minutes, eight, so I keep doubling the time between agitation cycles. It's a form of semi-stand development where you're progressively moving it less and less. And what this does is it promotes exhaustion of the developer in the highlights. So the developer does its thing on the mid-tone and highlight areas, but then it kind of keeps working on the shadows. The only downside to that is if you're using a developer that has a lot of restrainers in it, uh, like bromides, you can get some weird kind of dragging issues of that developer and unevenness as a result. So it's really critical that you have good regimen development and agitation and just like a consistent temperature environment you're working in. So thanks Ken for that question. And next I've got a, it looks like a big one from Blake. So Blake writes, I'm a big fan of your show and kindly answered my filter question on the last live stream. Oh, that was Q&A episode two. A lot's happened in the last two weeks. I found a deal too good to pass up and I've now culminated into an eight x 10 Cambo SC four holders and a Polaroid 8105 processor. Whoa. I'm an avid four x five shooter and I've been drawn to eight x 10 for the new Polaroid film in huge slides. I don't plan to shoot eight x 10 as my primary only for those specialty films. With that, onto my questions. As this camera was cheap, the bellows need a little work. I'll also be needing to test those holders after all is cleaned and repaired. How do you suggest I test my gear to be light, tight, in an affordable way? Would paper negatives work for this? Which I've never done before, question mark. Uh, what would you do? I'd prefer not to be wasting expensive sheets of film only to spend even more money at the lab to process. What do you think? Okay, I'm gonna go through these one at a time because they are kind of like separate questions. You've got quite a few here, Blake. So for testing sheets of film, you don't have to run film through in your film holders. You can actually just load black and white darkroom paper. So you'll take your darkroom paper, which shouldn't need trimmed down. I would just recommend really cheap um, resin coated paper. Load those sheets in under the safe light. You know, try to be quick. You don't want the safe light to potentially uh, pre-fog that film. So you load those sheets in, put them in the holders, and then just take those holders outside. 30 seconds to a minute should tell you if you've got a light leak in those film holders. So you can, you know, I wouldn't bake them in the sun, but get them in some, some direct or indirect sunlight. 30 seconds to a minute on each side, and that should be plenty. Now, you can do the same procedure to check your camera. What you can do is, if you have holders that you trust, don't have any marks after you develop those pa uh, papers out, you can load paper back up into those holders. Now you'll insert the dark slide into the camera, pull the slide out, and leave it there for a few minutes. I would say two to five minutes. That'll let you know if there's any pinholes in your bellows. And of course, you wanna have something on the front standard, so have a lens that's closed there. That'll confirm if you have any sort of light leaks going on in the bellows, near the front standard, um, or the spring back of the camera. Typically, the closer it is to the film plane, or in this case, the piece of paper, uh, the sharper that's going to appear. The more diffused it is, the further off that leak is probably somewhere in the bellows or near the front. So next question, large format case. Secondly, I need a case. I've been looking online for a Pelican 1650, but I'm afraid it could be too small. Are you familiar with this model? Well, funny you should ask. We just had that bags episode last Friday, and I recommend checking that one out because there I feature my Pelican 1630, which is actually a small step up from the 1650. I still never understand Pelican's numbers completely, but the 1650 case I think would have plenty of space for a Cambo SC 8x10, a few holders, and Polaroid stuff. It wouldn't hold that big Polaroid processor, the electronic one, but it would hold just about everything else. Third, do you have any tips on testing the Polaroid holder prior to exposure? While I've actually never tested Polaroid holders, I just kind of threw film right into them, I can imagine you'd be able to do the exact same procedure with the paper negatives that I just outlined where you put the paper in, except this time it's a book form holder, right? The holder has the, actually, do I have a holder around here? Yeah, let me grab a holder real quick. So Blake, you mentioned you had a Polaroid 8105 holder. I don't have any 8105s, but this is an 8106. This is a book form holder, which means I have these two little blue tabs. When I push on these tabs, it opens up like a book. This is to catch a little black envelope for the film. You could just place your paper right in here. 
Uh, this is your dark slide, so you would want to have uh, lay it this way with emulsion side, shiny side up. Close it, take it outside, and make sure the light leak. There's no light leaks in there. So these holders, I actually find, are really good light tightness wise because they have really nice seals. They've got this little, this little bit of velvet right here, and they have light seals kind of all around the place. But the number one place for failure is going to be those springs. So if there is a little too much flex right here on the side, you will get uh, some light leaks on there. And the new Polaroid films are actually really high speed. They're 640 ISO. So if something shows up on the paper, even if the faintest little bit, it's definitely going to show up in the finished print because ISO one and a half, ISO 640, you're going to notice it in the 640 way, way, way before. And your last question. So my final question, I still need a proper lens. As this camera is a large monorail camera, my 4x5 210 Schneider uh, is too small to focus even at infinity. I'm looking for the right modern lens that can be even uh, eventually swapped between my Cinar 4x5 and my new Cambo 8x10. Uh, I've been recommended the Schneider G Clairon 300 F9 and Nikkor 300 F9. What do you think? Thanks for your time. I'm so excited to shoot some Polaroid and transparency. Any tips would be helpful. Well, Blake, I'm kind of biased because I've only ever used F9 lenses when I'm shooting out in the field, but I have one of each type of kind of standard lens here in the studio. So I'm gonna grab those and show you what they look like. So I mentioned in the studio because one of these lenses I think is a little better suited for the studio and the other one, well, better for the field. So this is my Schneider 355G Claron. I've used this on the show a lot because it's like my favorite standard lens. It, the G Clarons are process lenses. They're great for coverage and they're usually pretty lightweight. Now both of these are Monster Copal number three shutter sizes, but this is an F9 300. And this one is a uh, Cinar Cirenar S, which is a Rodenstock blend lens. And you can see this one's a monster compared to this one. This is a F6.8 360 millimeter. So five millimeters difference in focus, very huge difference there. This doesn't even have a shutter on it and it weighs just short of five pounds because it's a monster. You have all this glass. This is a, a Cinar DB board for my uh, Cinar system shutter. But I think a F6.8 lens can be a little unwieldy when you're taking it out in the field. It adds a lot of weight to your kit. You could probably have two lenses in the same space that you would have just this one. And the F9 lenses are gonna be plenty bright on an eight x 10 ground glass. On four x five, it might get a little dim and you might run out of bellows pretty quickly on something like that. But for eight x 10, F9 is great. My first lens I ever had on eight x 10 was a Goers 14 inch red dot Artar, which is a 355-ish millimeter lens. And it was also F9, did great. Just had a kind of classic look to it. So I would say those 300 millimeter, 355 millimeter F9 lenses are super, super solid. Rule of thumb, if you can find one of those for less than $2 a millimeter, scoop it up. That's gonna be a really good deal. Thanks for stopping by today again, guys. If you have any questions that you want answered specifically about large format, you can email me largeformatquestions at gmail.com. And as I get enough of these, I'm gonna have more Q&A videos. And really these Q&A videos are also something that helps me figure out what you guys wanna see on the channel. So if you just wanna let me know what you wanna see more of, or you have any really in-depth questions, that's gonna be the best way to do it. And stick around because we're gonna keep going with Large Format Friday.